Hi. Uh, now I will talk about the amoebic and the pyogenic liver abscesses. The reason why I have chosen this topic because we usually read this topic in pieces in the textbooks. So if you read one textbook, that will be not enough for you to know the, the whole background about the amoebic and the pyogenic liver abscesses. One point to be mentioned that there is a third type of liver abscess, which usually we don't talk about it. It's the fungal liver abscess. Briefly about the fungal liver abscess, that is an immunocompromised patient, patients, those with uh, cancer or transplant, transplant uh, and the usual organism as candida, and the treatment, the first line of treatment is the cuspophagin. Now go back to our main topic, which is the amoebic and the pyogenic liver abscesses. There are five basic questions I have made to know that whether you know or you have a good background about the amoebic and the pyogenic liver abscesses or not. First question is the most common. Which type of liver abscess is the most common? As we all know, the amoebic is the most common type of liver abscess worldwide. But in the United States, it's the pyogenic. Now, the second question is the number. And this is one of the confusing points when you read the non-major textbooks references. I mean, like if you Google it, if you see in the radiology textbooks, you will have the, the common mistakes. So what, what is the answer if you have, is it solitary or multiple? Both of them are commonly solitary. Both of them are commonly solitary, but the biogenic is more likely to be multiple. Okay, so the differences usually we read it, uh, we read it that they mention the amoebic as solitary and the pyogenic as multiple. It's not true. The commonly both of them are solitary, but the pyogenic is more likely to be multiple. Do you know? This reminds me of one thing, one thing which is very basic for, since. And the, since we were medical students, that is for the groin hernia. This is the same confusing point that, there. That which is which one is more common in male or female? That is the uh, groin. Now, which is more common in the female? That is the femoral. This is the same basically confusing point that we have it there. Now we have we have it here for the uh, for, is it solitary or multiple? If we talk about the percentage, it's around eighty percentage solitary in the amoebic and in the pyogenic. It's mentioned in sabstone, 50 percentage, it's uh, solitary. That is in sabstone. But usually they mention that both of them commonly solitary. Okay. The organism in the amoeba, of course, this is the antimoeba hostolytica, that is the causing organism. In the pyogenic, it's 40, 40 percentage monomicrobial, 40 percentage polymicrobial, and the 20 percentage are culture negative. Polymicrobial or monomicrobial, that depends on the causing organism. Uh, I mean, causing uh, the cause of that one. If it is because of appendicitis, diverticulitis, the usual organism is uh, bacteroids. If it is because of the biliary, which is the most common, that is the gram negative bacilli, and commonly the E. coli, which is the most common uh, organism of that. Jaundice, is it in the pyogenic or the amoebic? That is in the pyogenic. Remember what can cause it. One of the causes for the pyogenic liver abscess is impaired biliary drainage. So logically, that is causing the one with the jaundice is the pyogenic. But is that always to have a jaundice for this patient? No. Commonly, they present with fever. The most common, both the amoebic and the pyogenic liver abscess. More commonly, they present with fever. They may ha yes, they may have also abdominal pain, but the jaundice is only in one third of patients with the pyogenic liver abscess. Antibiotic for the amoebic, it's the metronidazole, and the pyogenic, it's uh, you give empirical then culture paste, culture paste according to to the culture as I told you, forty percentage monomicrobial, forty percentage poly, and twenty percentage culture negative. Now let's go to let's talk deeply about the amoebic. First thing, the risk factors for it, it's the alcoholic and the traveling to Mexico. Not only Mexico, also we have the endemic areas like India and Africa. From the A also we can get that, you remember the antibody serology, you have to order it. It's alone and anterior superior in its location. And Kovi past, which is chocolate sauce, this is a common, common uh, question in the MCQs, they like, they like it. 
uh, M for metronidazole. Metronidazole you give it for seven. You give seven hundred fifty five hundred to seven hundred fifty uh, TID for a duration of seven days. You know, actually, the response will be within three days, or after three days, you will have respond response for the amoebic abscess after giving the metronidazole. But is that enough if you give metronidazole alone? Yes, it's enough in 90% of cases, but in around 10%, they will have a relapse. Why? Because you need actually to er eradicate the interluminal cysts by giving parmomycin. So actually we give two medications. One is the metronidazole and the other medication is the parmomycin to eradicate the interluminal cysts. It's the most common worldwide. Again, to remind, there is also one point uh, I didn't uh, I didn't add it here that the most common complication of amoebic abscess is rupture into the surrounding organ, either the peritoneum, pericardium, or the pleuropulmonary uh, space. E for edema peripherally. That is a finding in the CT that it's it's showing RM, but that is not non enhancement non enhancing and there is an edema. I will show you in the picture after this slide. Now let's say that, uh, okay, one also, the organism is intermebia hastalytica. Now let's say that you give the patient medication which is metronidazole and parmomycin, but he didn't respond. So what is the next step? That's the rule of aspiration. So aspiration is indicated uh, if not responding for five days, and if it is high risk for rupture, High risk for rupture, that means it is large, more than five centimeter, or it is in the left loop. Because if it is in the left loop, it's risky for rupture into the pericardium. Now, if, if it's ruptured, if it's ruptured before in the past, you do a lap laparotomy for the patient. Now, no, this is indication for aspiration actually. So if you have a rupture of the amoebic cyst, before you do a laparotomy, but nowadays you do aspiration. This is actually nowadays indication for aspiration is uh, having rupture for the amoebic abscess. It's clearly mentioned in Sabston and uh, in Cameron textbook. Now the indications for surgery, if failed percutaneous drainage, if there is hemorrhage, if there is erosion into the surrounding structure. It's not rupture, it's erosion into the surrounding structure. Okay, yes, this is the one which, which I told you to remember that E for edema peripherally. Edema peripherally, if you see the black arrow, it's showing the edema and it's non-enhancing non rim with the peripheral edema. Yes, it's mentioned in one textbook, which is, which is Schwartz, that there is a peripheral enhancement and edema. But this, is, this picture is taken from, the, from Sabstone and clearly mentioned rim is non-enhancing and actually we can see it easily. It's non-enhancing and with peripheral edema. Now let's talk about the pyogenic. It's poly, is it true? No, it's actually solitary, but more likely to be, to be multiple. That's why I mentioned poly with a question mark. Now positive blood culture in around 50%. Percutaneous aspiration is first line. Is it truly the first line? Actually, the antibiotics you will give it, plus that the patient will need aspiration. That's my. That's why they mention it. They like to mention first line, because you have to do uh, mostly the percutaneous aspiration. The biliary tree is the most common cause of pyogenic liver abscess. In the past, it's the appendicitis or diverticulitis. But now, currently, the biliary is the most common cause of the pyogenic liver abscess. G for gram-negative bacilli and commonly the E. coli. Yes, I mentioned the group because it's more commonly the group it, itself, not only the E. coli. The group is gram-negative bacilli, which includes E. coli or maybe Klebsiella or Proteus, but more commonly is the E. coli. EN, that is for enhancement peripherally. Now, let's say that even before the ultrasound, let's say that you suspect a liver abscess based on what? Clinically and radiologically, even by the x-ray. Three findings in the x-ray could help you to think of liver abscess. One is elevation of the right hemidiaphragm. And the second thing is right pleural effusion. Third thing, right atelectasis. So if you see these findings, 
yes, you cannot say this is biogenic or amoebic, but at least you suspect the liver abscess plus the, the clinical picture of the patient. And you do ultrasound, which is showing hypoacuic lesion, uh, maybe well-defined borders, and you take a blood culture, then you give him the IV antibiotics, and you do CT abdomen and pelvis. If there is source that is from the abdomen or pelvis, that means you have to take the patient to the surgery. But if there is no source, so that depends on the criteria on the CT, criteria of that abscess on the CT. If it is simple or multiple, large. So you have to do percutaneous drainage, and if that fails, so you'll need the surgery. Now, if there is multiple but small, I mean, there, there is no source and it's multiple, uh, multiple and small, so you have to give IV antibiotics for long course. What's the usual dura duration or classical duration for giving a patient of antibiotics? It's around four to six weeks. Despite that, you do the drainage, but you have to give him the antibiotics, antibiotics for four to six weeks. In the amoebic liver abscess we mentioned, you give it for around seven days, but they will respond actually even after three days. But in the pyogenic liver abscesses, you have to give it for a duration of four to six weeks. I hope by this, I concluded the major differences between the amoebic and the pyogenic liver abscesses. Uh, and as I mentioned, this usually you take it in pieces from different textbooks. These are the text, our major textbooks. I have taken it from them. The current surgical therapy, which is Cameron, Schwartz, Greenfield, and Sabston. Collectively, I gave you the data, uh, the data regarding the differences between them. Hopefully that you get the information in a simple way. And if you have any question, just send it 